so that should be recording hopefully um good afternoon everybody welcome to the whiskey circus um we're very lucky today to have ian from glen murray um and for those of you who don't really know ian um oh what's going on ah there we are um he has a couple of day jobs um so he does glen murray and he's not working i knew it had cock up today uh, stop the sharing i don't know yeah we did have an intro for you ian but it's not working that's okay <laughs> but again, but, I, I, I don't think I deserve an intro and uh, saying you're very lucky to have me, I think that's uh, stretching it a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we... J judge that after the session. Ah, uh, here we are. Is it going to let me do it? Um, hopefully, it should be coming up, hopefully. There we are. Okay. Hopefully, you can <laughs> So that's, that's Ian in his day job. Um, we all know him by that one. So, right, let's keep the cast safe. <laughs> um, right, so, Ian, would you like to introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about you and what you do. Okay, so um, yeah, a lot of faces on here I recognise, um, <laughs> and a lot of people who've probably spent longer with me than they probably want to, but uh, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, the introduction we had before you started recording where everybody was holding up the whiskey they were drinking, um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep it in my head that that's what you would have been drinking even if this was a Glenfiddich tasting. Um, but uh, my name, so those of you who don't know me, I mean Alan, I, uh, as, as Soren has touched on, I have got a multitude of hats for Glen Murray. I work with our marketing team. Um, I'm manager of our visitor center uh, and I'm also our global brand ambassador. So um, at the moment, it's pretty much just brand ambassador duties that I am fulfilling because, you know, as you all know, this should have been a time where the visitor center was absolutely at its busiest, um, would have been our busiest weekend of the year, as is normal with the Spirit Speyside Whiskey Festival. But sadly, COVID-19 has put paid to that. So, um, yeah, so, yeah, so we get to do stuff like this, um, chat to people like we would. It's as much as this has all been great fun. You know, I've been doing tastings for the past three, four weeks on Zoom and everything else. Uh, it's absolutely no replacement for sitting down and having a dram with people and uh, spending time with them face to face. So um, I'm really grateful you could join. It's keeping me sane doing stuff like this. Uh, so, yeah, delighted that you could join us this afternoon. So when you say sane, do you mean sane or do you mean just the fact that you're still got an excuse to drink? It's well, yeah. It's 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 great to have a job where I can go, <laughs> go with my wife. I'm going up to my room to drink whiskey. It's work. Leave me alone. Mm -hmm. uh, it's there's very few jobs in the world where you can do that. So I'm grateful for it. I am, um, and yeah, you know, I hear people that they've learned languages. They they've baked bread and everything. I've just eaten more bacon and drunk more whiskey. That's kind of been my claim to fame over the lockdown period. That, that's going to be the thing, isn't it? We'll, we're all going to come out of the lock. I mean, I'm lucky because I'm still at work, but we're all going to come out of the lockdown and probably gained about three stone. Yes. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll have gained, gained three stone and probably spent a fortune on replacing my whiskey collection <laughs> that I'm getting through a rate of knots. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be an interesting one. I am, I'm looking forward to the party once we are back together again, because I think it's going to be phenomenal. I think the party will kill us before COVID-19 does. So, I mean, obviously, I think, are we, it would have been Spirit of Space Out this week then, is it? Yes, this weekend. Yep. Uh, so last night should have been uh, the resurrection of the Glen Murray barbecue. We didn't do it last year uh, because we hosted the closing event, which yep. would have been tonight. Uh, so because that space wasn't uh, available to us. So we were bringing about the barbecue in Cayley. So probably today would have been me clearing up the aftermath of having 200 people Cayleying, drinking and eating at the distillery. So that would have been the kind of uh, job for me today. It's not the most fun job in the world, but um, it's worth it for the, the actual event the night before. And so have you got a bottle in, bottled up ready that would have been the distillery exclusive or... 
Well, we we don't do um, spirit of space side bottlings. We did one once, um, but Glen Murray, we're not we're not a collectible whiskey. We're a whiskey which I think people drink, which I'm I'm quite proud mm. of and pleased of. Uh, so we don't end up whenever we release something. We don't have the situation a McAllen will have where people are blocking traffic for two days just to get a whiskey, which ultimately most of them will never drink, but hey-ho. Um, so we ended up having a whiskey, um, Spirit Speyside release that we did that sat on the shelf for about a month, and it, it's, it's not a good look. So what we do is we bring out our distillery exclusives, which tend to be two or three casks that we will release um for the weekend of Spirit of Speyside. Um, and they tend to be with us for about, you know, eight to nine months uh, available. So we did have three casks that were selected. Um, in fact, it was the last three that Graham chose for us before he departed. And they were three wine casks that we would have released on Friday. They were due to be bottled last week. Um, because of the situation, the bottling is backed up a little bit, so we're not getting the bottled now. I, can't, I honestly can't remember if it's the 4th of May or the 14th of May that they're actually now scheduled for bottling. Uh, we'll see them delivered to the distillery, usually about a week after bottling. We're, we're looking at what, how we're going to promote it and how we're going to push it at the moment. Um, we're, we're currently developing a new website for Glen Murray, which is scheduled to go live in May. So there's a little bit of a, a behind the scenes kind of announcement because I don't think we've spoken about it elsewhere. Um, <clears throat> that new website that we're launching is actually not going to have a whiskey shop on it. We're not going to be retailing direct for online anymore. It's going to be directing people to, um, you know, suppliers or retailers that have the specific product that they click on to the install. So it will take you to the likes of the Whiskey Exchange, Master yeah. of Malt, wherever. So that, that's the plan for our, our new website. So promotion will be done via social media um, in the, the, this kind of era um, for mail order at the moment. Uh, but we've yet to decide how that's going to look. Because at the moment, what we don't have is somebody at the other end of the phone. So if you phone the visitor centre, uh, mm -hmm. the likelihood of you getting somebody, unless Christoph is actually sitting there. <laughs> the phone is right behind you, by the way, from where you're sitting. Yeah, um, I can take orders. Yeah, you can take orders. So <laughs> Christoph will Not sure I'll send anything, but I can take orders. Sure, <laughs> no problem. Could be a good discount, one. Christoph. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I've got a, a special price, but it's uh, <laughs> just funny, sorry. <laughs> so yeah, so how that looks and how we're going to manage it, not sure. Um, those three whiskies are three wine casks. Um, they are full maturation Chardonnay, uh, full maturation Burgundy, and a full maturation Chenin Blanc. So they're about, I think it's about 200 bottles per cask. Um, retail on that, I, I honestly don't know. I've not had that discussion with the sales team yet. Uh, so it'll probably, you know, don't quote me, but between 70, 80 pound mark, I would think there or thereabouts. So they, they would keep your eye on those. Are they going to be sort of in the same packages as the 94 and 98 then? Or? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So this, um, these packages, the, the kind of white coloured packages yeah. that we created, okay. um, that was produced and this is where I, one of my other hats I wear, you know, that was one that I was involved in creating for, for distillery exclusives so that we could have a, kind of one of the common questions when visitors come to the distillery is, what do you get here? What can you sell here that we can't get anywhere else? Yeah. And I wanted a, a differentiator and packaging so we can go, the ones in the white boxes are distillery exclusives exclusives. The ones in the blue boxes are uh, standard releases that are available in certain markets. Now our marketing team liked the white packages so now it's been adopted by the likes of the Curiosity series so that doesn't quite work so well anymore but um, it's, it's a nice kind of differentiator as being something a little bit more exclusive and limited uh, yeah. with regards to our packaging. And so once we get back to the point of normality um, what are the current what were your own casks that you have on site? I, I, I no no I can remember because you know we've you know they've not sold as quick as they should you know because yeah. ultimately bottle your own whilst we do mail order the majority are sold to those that come through the door uh, who want to fill their own bottle so we're still sitting on ones we've actually had for a little while uh, yeah. we've got the Saturn's cask um, which is uh, full maturation uh, we've got uh, do, 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 do. we've got the peated red wine, which I think is that the one, Marina, you have the Gamay cask. Is that the one you were drinking? 
Nope, no, yeah, I thought you had that one. Uh, so we have the peated red wine cask, um, and we have um, what's the other one? Um, uh, Italian uh, fortified wine, and my, my brain has just gone dead. Uh, Marsala cask. Marsala. That's the one. Well done. Yeah. Um, he just needs to look at them. They're just next to him. <laughs> uh, no, but I, I, I remember what you put aside for for me. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and I guess now is not the, the perfect time to get them sent to me. But uh, yes, I remember we... you have for me uh, a Sauterne, a Gamay, a Petit Gamay, and a Marsala cask. Absolutely. So, <laughs> so the Marsala and the Sauternes um, were those kind of three distillery exclusives being Graham's last cask selection. The um, kind of new era, the Marsala and Sauternes are, are my first cask selection. So these are two that I, I really like. So um, if you do have them uh, or you are getting them, if you don't like them, then you're wrong, basically. <laughs> the so can we still get hold of them at the moment or is, is the distillery actually fully shut? I was well, it's, it's the distillery is operational it's working uh, so yeah. yeah so uh, basically I'm pretty much going in uh, usually about three times a week you know, kind of going in Monday Wednesday and Friday so it, it is pretty much a lottery and this is something which we're, we're talking about and how we manage if we are going to promote uh, the fact that we have these bottlings available for mail order. Um, so it's, a, it's a pretty much a lottery if you phone up and I'm there, basically. If I'm there, we process the order, we ship it out, we get it going, it's not a problem. If I'm not there, there's nobody there to take the call. Uh, so it's just a case of just phoning you know, during working hours, nine to five, and fingers crossed if I'm around, I'll answer the phone and sort it out for you. Obviously, going forward, if we are looking to promote and push a product, you know that kind of hit or miss approach is, is not suitable so we will look at um, getting a more established method of contact um, or email is the other way and that way we can arrange a, a time and a date and so what were the prices of those three then i don't think i missed it yeah so marsala 55 um the sauternes is 99 and the peated red wine is 55 so basically Basically, Sorry. within our pricing and our approach with um, our, our bottle your own, we have the three casks. We will always have a peated expression available uh, because the, the kind of container, the, the cask that it's held in um, is, is kind of primed for peated. So we don't have that taint carrying on through to the next cask following up. Um, with the other two, tends to be a younger expression uh, for £55 and an older expression for 99 So it's a pretty uh, established set system that we have. With the peated, it'll always be 55 for the time being because we don't have old peated stocks. So um, the oldest we can do at the moment is nine years old. Uh, ten, sorry, no, ten years right. old. And the uh, Sotan cask, uh, maybe from... Uh, a castle uh, in France, starting with a Y that you can name, yeah, that you cannot name if I'm right. It, right? it is, yes. Yeah. It is, <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, so these are great casks. These are casks which I've had my eye on for for years, and you know they, they've been they've been amazing for a long time. Um, and when Kirsty joined us, you know she came up and we we sat for a bit, and we talked about you know some casks and things that were, you know that that I was aware of, and you know to save kind of short circuit her having to go through the entire stock, um, and immediately I highlighted the Saturns. Uh, so she she looked and sat down with a stock and she actually kind of you know she agreed which was uh, good uh, so we're actually going to be releasing a bigger release of the Saturns um, in the future I don't have a date for it um, because things are kind of you know falling out with the calendar that we had planned uh, so there, there will be a Saturns release on a, a kind of broader availability in the very foreseeable future and for me I I love these casks. I, I can't talk more highly about them. They've been stunning for a long time. Um, they're so rich. They, they offer so much character to the whiskey. Um, and it just, it, it sits really nicely with the Glen Murray spirit. You know, that kind of sweetness with the combined with that kind of dessert wine so Terrence approach works really, really well, in my opinion. So watch out for those. You know, I will be banging the drum about them because I, I love them a lot. So what, what is the reason you're not allowed to name them then? 
uh, we don't. It's it's a brand name that we don't um, own. Um, it's a, it's a brand which is owned by LVMH. So these casks were casks that we were able to tap into during the era where we were uh, owned by LVMH. Yeah. So it's it's just a branding issue, you know. It's it's like the the, the it's a it's a kind of very very exclusive premium, um, Sauternes expression. In fact, I did a tasting, um, probably about three years ago now, where I, I managed to kind of select a few casks and warehouse that I could get direct, um, kind of uh, provenance of exactly the brand and the style that was in the cask before. And we did a tasting where you tasted the whiskey alongside the actual product that came out of that cask. And I, I really wanted to include the Saturns, but the price of the ticket would have had to have doubled to give me the volume required to pour a tiny little tasting um, for people because it's a very premium um, Saturns. Yeah. So, I mean, are we allowed to name it? I, yes, yeah, yeah, we, yeah, you can name it, and um, that that looks about right. Yeah, that, I've, that put, could be. yeah I've put many hints on uh, yeah. so, uh, so, uh, GM group. So, so, so yeah, so, so I'm something not like that. that one got in there. It's funny, you know, it used to be chalked on, and we we chalked it on, and we had. Um, I don't know if you watched the Three Drinkers on Amazon Prime. Yeah. Uh, so they came to visit Glen Murray, um, and it was it was actually it was actually meant to be Graham that was on it, but he handed in his notice. Uh, so we decided that it was going to be broadcast after we left. So we thought. So they came to me. Unfortunately, I was in Russia at the time, uh, so I didn't have to be in front of camera, which is not my most comfortable position. Uh, so it was handed over to Emma, um, and she very smartly realised that that we had to wipe out the chalk on the Chateau of Chemcast. So if you can see it on three drinkers, um, it's actually been rubbed out and switched over to Sauterne so that it wasn't on camera. No, right, yeah, no. I mean, yeah, I don't know how that picture got on the phone, really. Um, it's, it's obviously one of those cheeky little ones, but. Um, so sort of one of the questions I was gonna ask uh, was why did you actually get into whiskey then, or how did you get into whiskey? I, well, I was born and brought up in Speyside, so always been surrounded by whiskey. Um, I moved away to go to university in Aberdeen, I, where I studied law and management. During that time, I had a part-time job um, in a thresher store, so wines and spirits merchants. Um, so I found myself more interested in the spirits category in general, not, not so much solely focused on whiskey. Um, but yes, yeah, spirits was uh, something which really interested me, and it was it was, and I've said this a couple of times in kind of recent conversations. Um, there was an actual epiphanous moment. I was when I was at university, I was dating a Belgian girl, so I spent some time over in Belgium and in Europe, and I did a bit of travelling around about Europe, and it was just sitting in a bar and seeing Glenfiddich in Aberlour and thinking that's on my doorstep, and every bar I went to. Um, I was like, that's that's products that are just round about my house. And it clicked then that, you know, this was quite an important category. Um, and what was surrounding me, I took for granted. Um, and I, I just decided at that point onwards that if the world's interested in, in what surrounds me, then I should maybe pay more attention myself. So I, I applied for a job at Macallan um, back in 2002. Um, which was my first introduction to Scotch whiskey. In fact, they sent me to Highland Park for three days to do training. Um, so really Highland Park was my, my kind of uh, first love, you know, with whiskey because I spent time there. It was the first time I'd been to a distillery other than just doing a tour. I uh, learned a lot and um, loved it. And from there, the rest has kind of been history. And well, obviously- you didn't actually marry the Belgian girl, no. I did not know. Um, you know, at the time. I have I, to ask as a Belgian. I, I, I have to ask. Sorry. At the time, at the time, I was studying EU law, and I, and I really wanted to work in Brussels and to move out there. I still love Belgium. Um, don't love a Belgian girl anymore. I married a local girl. Um, I decided to to stay closer to home. Um, yes. So uh, now she won't let me go back to Belgium because she thinks I have too many memories. So. <laughs> <laughs> And so, obviously, we've kind of discussed the fact that you have a few roles within Glenmurray. Um, yes. What is it that really keeps you going? And what's, you know, what is the favourite part of the job? Or is it just the whole job, the job as a whole? 
Well, it's, the job as a whole, and you know that you know a lot of people asked you know why I left McAllen to go to Glen Murray, and um, you know the, the reason is the job, absolutely. You know the brand itself, the McAllen is an amazing brand, a whiskey which I absolutely love and have an affinity for because I spent so long there. Um, but it was a very um, compartmentalized role. I was the manager of the visitor center, and that's all you kind of did. Um, you know when you are working with such a big brand opportunity to to kind of diversify is there but you have to either kind of move within the business with glenn murray um you know you have to take on so many roles um mm -hmm. because we are a smaller brand smaller company and that's what i love about the job um i really enjoy it. and also the liquid is bloody good and i, I like knocking preconceptions you know it's, it's a very much a reverse effect you know mccallum kind of is up there for people to knock off their pedestal um, and I always kind of felt bad for it because, you know, it, it, it was no fault of their own that they reached such a kind of, um, kind of colossal position within the, the malt whiskey category. Whereas we kind of don't have that. We have to build ourselves up and yeah. talk about it. And it's, it's a better approach to take. I like surprising people with the quality of the whiskey we have. Um, and taking cast samples and single cast Glen Murrays to people who maybe only recognize Glen Murray from the perspective of the classic, which is a great whiskey, which, you know, I'm proud of. Um, but within the, the kind of hardcore whiskey enthusiasts, it's not going to be anybody's favorite dram. You know, I'm fully accepting of that. Um, but when we pull out some of the amazing cask samples, uh, we can knock down preconceptions and kind of see a kind of uh, light bulb moment with people with Glenn Murray. So yeah. it's, it's... You know what I like, Owen, I mean, like you sort of said at the start about McKellen, their sort of like their spirit space I releases, very little of them, very few of them are, are ever going to get opened and Glenn Murray's a drinking whiskey. Yep. And that's what I love about it. That's, 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 for me, that's what whiskey's there for. It's there to be drunk. It's there to be enjoyed. That's why it's been produced. It's not been there to, I mean, some, some may disagree, but it's not there to sit on a shelf for 40 years and talk Absolutely. to it and tickle it and whatever else it's, it's there to you know it's there to, to enjoy and crack it open and i think it's a very it's a very honest thing to do i think it's, I think it's great yeah no. and it's you know we've all done it i think you know um you know i have bottles on my shelf that i have no plans of opening because what i paid for them to what they are now worth so i, I, I kind of I'm involved in that side of things to some extent so um you know like you can't knock it um you know, as a brand, you know, the liquid for McCann, the liquid for all single malts is great. It's just finding ones that you prefer. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, I think it's, uh, you know, a different approach um, uh, to actual the marketing of the brand that makes the difference. I mean, I've never understood why people put bottles on a shelf anyway. Um, <laughs> you know, it, I mean, exactly, look at you now. Um, but, you know, it, it's, what I was going to say, and you kind of all, all sort of touched in there a little bit, Ian, was, um, obviously, with Glen Murray, you know, you've, you're not a small distillery. I think your capacity is about 5.7 million litres. Um, we, did si all, we did 6 million last year. So. Yeah, 6 million. Six, wow. yep. 6 million. And then you've obviously got the scope to increase that if you bring the old distillery part back online. But why, why do you think Glen Murray is or, or overlooked? Do you think it's the pricing, you know, that because you have a cheap side as in the you know the elgin classics that people just don't consider you serious enough anymore or do you think it's just that you you're not getting the education out there i, th I think there's, there's, there's a it's not one thing i think it's a kind of multiple factors of things that, that people take a certain approach with brands one is branding and packaging um you know, I'm a sucker for sexy looking packaging. Yeah. You know, I've bought whiskey that, <laughs> yeah. that looks great um, on the shelf and I bought it because of the packaging and then finally get around to tasting it and wondering why I'd spent my money on that. So we've all done that before. So, you know, we, we maybe need to up our game a little bit on making the packaging a little bit sexy. We've done a great job, I think, on the 21. Um, when we did Mastery, I thought that packaging, our, our marketing team did a fantastic job on that. So, you know, we're, we're, we're still starting to get a, a better handle on that approach of things. Um, you know, as a whiskey drinker myself, you know, the packaging is secondary, but you know, it, does, it is great to have it yeah. in looking good. Um, the other side of it is, I think what you've said is, you know, I, I'll stand at a whiskey show and I'll overhear 
somebody you know talking about it and saying oh they don't drink Glen Murray because um, it's the cheap one in the supermarket shelves but I've just heard them two minutes at the, the stand across there complaining at how expensive another brand is yeah. getting so you can't win them all um, there are some people that are going to judge it and ultimately what I say to everybody is single malt whiskey is a very protected um, process you know the Scotch Whiskey Act will define what you can and can't do so there, there's no real cutting of corners a, a lot of the expense and the price that you'll pay in a bottle of whiskey does come down to the marketing so um, it's a catch-22 situation if we do want uh, Glen Murray to come in lovely sexy looking packaging the likelihood is that we will have to pay a little bit more for it um, so I, I don't know I don't know what consumers think but um, uh, from my point of view the, the liquid is there the, the quality yeah. um, it, it, it can stand particularly when we hit the heights of cast strength and single cask we can stand equal to um, if not above a lot of other whiskies out there you just need to look at SMWS bottlings the amount of people that come to Glen Murray having discovered us through the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society single casking is phenomenal um, and the, the annoying thing for many years is that we couldn't hand them anything to say, right, okay, well, here's a distillery bottling single cask. Mm. Now we are rectifying that. We're able to, to bring something to the table which can stand up against it and be equal to, if not better, because now we're keeping those amazing casks to ourselves. We are still working with some independent bottlers, um, but we're, we're able to bring it to market as a single cask product as well. Yeah, no, I mean, talking about. Oh, I was sorry, just, just a just a quick question for <laughs> sorry, just a quick question for for Fiona. Uh, Ian, talking about uh, SMWS, what is uh, the SMWS bottle behind you over your shoulder? I um, I've got two. I've got um. Oh, one this one we don't see. Oh, yeah, I've got this <laughs> one. I've got um, thirty-five, which is afternoon tea for elegant ladies. Um, <laughs> nice. this one I actually bought this one I was down um, on Burns Night I went to the SMWS dinner in Burns Night in Glasgow and I bought this one and again this is all I got to try it and it wasn't my favourite one of the night but if we're going to talk about being a sucker for packaging or something like that um, this one was distilled on the 6th of April 2011 now my daughter was born on the 6th of May 2011 so <laughs> the only reason I bought this one was because it was one exactly one month from the date my daughter was born so that one I'm keeping for her when she's old enough to enjoy a whiskey with me um, the other one um, this so, was one I, 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 this one I absolutely love, um, which was, uh, it's a Glen Grant, a cheery treat. Um, it is really, really nice. I love a Glen Grant, um, single cask particularly. It's always a favorite of mine. Um, I also have a load of other SMWSs, but prior to all this kicking off, um, I was in the process of moving, we were looking at moving house, so I've packaged a lot of my whiskey and put it round to my dad's. Now, my dad likes a dram, so I'm hoping when this kind of counts down, <laughs> it's all yeah, still that's there. Dangerous. So all my 35s are currently at my dad's house, because um, I've got some cracking um, sherry casks that are sitting waiting for a special occasion. No, I mean, that kind of brings two things, because obviously you saying about your daughter and that, and that bottling, obviously, I think everybody knows the reason I fell in love so much with the 1994 because when we spoke to Graham, he was of the opinion, he wasn't sure exactly whether it was August 94 or September 94. So obviously my daughter was born 1994 in September, uh, in August. Um, and that's where this sort of original affinity came. And then we obviously poured that at her wedding as well. So, um, Obviously, that's become a favourite. But what I was going to go back to was, as we was talking about the Elgin Classics and, and the bottom end sort of thing, exactly how you've said where, when I poured Glen Murray on, on the bloggers table for you, um, the amount of people that have come up and have seen the Elgin Classic, the bourbon, the sherry, um, the peated, was the only three we put on. And they've all sort of said, yeah, you know, we, we don't look at it, we've not tasted it because of how cheap it is. You give them some, and they're all, I suppose, blown away sounds too exaggerated, but they are blown away the fact that it's a lot better than they anticipated it to be. And it, it's strange to me that people consider buying whiskey purely on price. 
Yeah, it is a strange concept, um, you know, because, you know, people generally like a bargain. Um, but mm. with um, Scotch single malt whiskey, there is a kind of snobbery factor to it to some extent. Um, it's, you know, I can't remember who it was. Somebody's pouring themselves the Port Classic. It's an amazing whiskey at 25 quid a pop. Um, there you go. It's, you know, we've had we've had one or two issues with consistency around port casks, which I think, you know, we we've ironed out to some extent. Um, but you know, that's a natural colour. Um, it's about five six years old on average. Some younger stock, some older stock mixed, and for twenty five quid, um, I I challenge anybody, you know, to find anything better than that at that standard price you can get a lot of whiskies on offer promotion coming down from 35 40 quid to 25 for promotion but we're we're starting at 25 and you can sometimes get it on offer for 20 quid um you know i challenge anybody to get something better to, than that i like it it's great yeah. it's an amazing whiskey oh, yeah. challenge challenge accepted because i've got yes. the, the sherry cast Sherry oh, cost is twenty-two pounds, and that's delicious too. So. There you go. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'll, so I'll be honest, Ian. I've, I've, I'm kicking myself a little bit because I recorded a review of this yesterday. And I yep. wasn't sure whether it was natural colour or not. So now I know that you've made my life a little bit difficult because I'm going to have to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> the the beauty of it, you know, and, and I was saying this, you know, we were doing uh, doing a tasting for the SMWS um, virtual pub on Friday night. And they asked me to choose a whiskey and out of all our range, I chose the port cast because A, it's, you know, it's affordable, it's readily available. And at these kind of times of, of challenging situation, not everybody has got a lot of cash available. Um, and they also don't have the opportunity to go wandering around drink shops all day, finding a bottle. So I chose it on that basis. You know, it's, it's one which, you know, most people can get a hold of. It's not going to break the bank and it's just a great whiskey off the back of it. You know, it's so fruity and, you know, that natural color, um, you know, you, you probably assumed it wasn't natural color because it's so rich in color and that's down to the fact that you know as a company we're, we're tapping into the resources that we have throughout the different products that we produce because we don't just produce uh, whiskey we also uh, La Martini Quez is the world's number one port producer so we have access to great fresh port casks and that pays dividends in, in a product like the classic port finish. Well, Ian, speaking of um, the La Martini Quez um, sort of ownership situation in you kind of mentioning the rum hybrid do you yep. guys have um, any plans to maybe tap into some of those connections to um, maybe do a, a full term rum cask maybe for the distillery or something oh that would be nice um, I don't think um, off the top of my head I'm not sure whether we have a full term rum cask from um, any of the uh, La Martini Quez portfolio because we have De Paz and we have St. James. Uh, the rum agricole that we released into the UK as part of the Curiosity range, which is the drama I'm having right now, um, is from St. James. Uh, and I see Frank in France, you might see the fact that we had a, um, we had the classic expression from, there was a French only release for the Calice. Yeah, rum cask finish, but yes, I, I know I've looked for it. Uh, yes. Okay, it was a Depaz. I've looked for it many times. I've uh, never, uh, I've never seen it uh, on the shelf mm -hmm. in the shop. You, you However, saw it. I, I poured uh, it for I, you in Paris, remember? <laughs> <laughs> but when we were, uh, when we were I at Whiskey Life uh, Paris, you were probably quite drunk at that point. But I definitely poured it for you, Whiskey Life Paris. I remember. Uh, no, you poured me the Chardonnay. No, when you came back later in the day, I remember pouring <laughs> you the the rum. Okay, cap. but uh, I found yeah. it anyway at, uh, at a bar near uh, at a bar in Rennes. So. Uh, uh, I bought a drum of it, uh, took some back uh, in a sample to do uh, a, a blog post I still have to do to compare it with the Rum Agricole one. And, uh, but for now, I've just seen it twice on some whiskey bars or whiskey pubs. But uh, what, I, what I like in particular about that release is that it actually has the De Paz branding on the packaging. Um, it's something which uh, I've been pushing our marketing team to do for quite some time. I like that synergy. I like that story. And I like that ability. You know, I spoke earlier about doing a tasting where I could actually get the exact product. Um, I think as whiskey drinkers, um, you know, it's, you guys probably uh, more in line with kind of education and probably seek out 
uh, you know, what, where the flavor comes from. And I think having that approach of, you know, complete visibility, um, I think is a great thing to do within a product. You know, within our larger releases, um, certainly our straight bourbon cash releases, that's, gonna, that's challenging and probably not something we can do because we don't get from a single source. But with any of the finishes and anything like that, I think it's great. And I think just from the point of education, uh, from a drinks perspective, where a consumer can then seek out, you know, something else to find out how flavor is forming within your whiskey is a great opportunity and a great thing to do. I don't agree with that massively. Sorry, sorry, Soren. I would agree with that, that, that massively. Um, saying sort of the, the knowledge of it is, is interesting. Uh, I had a bottle of, I think it was Balvenie Peat Week. Mm. And the bit that said on the cask, uh, oh, sorry, on the cask, on the bottle that came in, there was loads of information about how they made it, the levels of peat, the different types of peat. And just reading all that stuff was really interesting. It was really, I don't know, fun to find out how they've made that particular flavour profile in that whiskey. And I think knowing that, you can enjoy the drink more. Absolutely. I think knowing more about it's better. Knowledge is power. <laughs> Absolutely. And just, you know, understanding, you know, it, obviously there are challenges, you know, I'm talking about the Saturns earlier on, there's branding issues if you don't actually own the product. Um, but a lot of the casks we are now using, you know, within the port we are, within the rum we are, um, within the... Um, Within wine, to some extent, we, we've got a little bit of a tie-up, although we don't have direct ownership. Uh, it's something which we can look at doing. And it's something which I've been pushing on, so hopefully we'll be able to do that uh, in the future. Uh, we'll see how it goes. I mean, sort of looking at a lot of your whiskies, and I think we touched on it a little bit before Graham left, um, that what interests me especially is the fact that I think about 90% of your finishes uh, all start life in a first fill bourbon cask, which obviously tells us that it's intentional finishing rather than covering something up. So is this something that will carry on forward or do you think we might see more finishes from sort of second and third fill casks to give them that flavour because they're just lacking a little bit? No, I don't think so. Um, you know, ultimately, you know, sometimes, you know, I, I make no bones about the fact that, you know, sometimes we've put it in a finish to, you know, rescue a whiskey. You know, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you want to make a whiskey better? So I think finishing to make and improve a whiskey is not a bad thing because ultimately we want to bring the best product out. But um, I'll agree with you, you know, times where finishing is intentional. Uh, finishing is where you are looking to add an extra layer where you still want that underlying burden urban characteristic to come through is something which we will continue and will form a part of what Glenn Murray does. And a lot of that is, you know, thanks to Graham and what he did was switching the, the kind of reliance on second fill casks within the Glen Murray portfolio to first fill. And, mm -hmm. and that's, again, that, that ties into that kind of very subjective a personal approach within people in distilling. Um, because, you know, Ed, who was our previous distillery manager, he had a far greater preference for Glen Murray and second fill casks. So it wasn't that we were cutting corners or uh, making things cheaper. That was an approach chosen and selected by the distillery manager at the time because he felt that was the best showcase for Glen Murray. Um, and then when Graham came on board, he flipped it because he felt that first fill was more his style and his approach. Now, you know, with the change of people and personnel, there'll always be a, a change of direction, a change of approach. Uh, we haven't directly replaced Graham. Um, you know, we, we, when Graham was doing the role, um, he had two jobs, you know, much like a lot of people within uh, LM where you can kind of pick up bits and pieces. But his two jobs were getting very big. You know, with the introduction of Cuddy Sark into the portfolio, the master blender and distillery manager job was almost untenable for a single person. So it, it was the right time to make that decision to divide those roles. So we now have Ross Murphy, who will manage the spirit production side of things. Um, now, Ross is our manager at our grain distillery as well. So he joined us from William Grants a few years ago and he manages... Um, Starlock, which is our grain distillery, and also uh, Glen Murray. Typically, he would be up about once a week, um, you know, managing the site, kind of um, 
and he's made changes. He's made tweaks to production. Um, you know, I'm doing a series of little short clips for our social media channels on what's been happening recently around production. Um, his focus of late has been very much around uh, the mash done. Uh, we felt we were overloading it a little bit, so he slowed down the, the number of mashes, uh, also reduced the volume that we're putting through. So that's it's a change that we've made. Um, now then we've got uh, Dr. Kirsty McCallum, who joined us from Distel in October, um, which was an absolute coup for us. You know, um, Buna Avon was one of my favorite whiskies. You know, the stuff that they've been putting out of late has been amazing. So to have her on board, you know, be delighted if she does, you know, as good as what she did there. Um, but that means that everything, as soon as it goes from spirit to cask to marriage, she'll manage that within... Um, the kind of realms of blends, of which we have Curry Sark, Sir Edwards and Label 5, and within our single malts, which, well, single malt singular, which is Glen Murray. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting thing, because that was one of the questions I was going to ask about Graham, because obviously he was, I believe, the fifth master blender distiller at uh, the company. So in theory, he, he is the last as well, at the way it's looking, because... You, you've gone to a company rather than an individual on the on site. Well, really, we didn't. He wasn't the fifth master blender because um, you know he was a fifth distillery manager, really yeah. master distiller. Um, prior to that, we were under Glen and LVMH. It would have been Bill Lumsden yeah. and Rachel Barry who was doing the blending. So the role was segregated at that stage, and it wasn't until we went to LM that we pulled that in together as a single role. Now, what we've done is realised that it, it's too big a job for one person, as I say, particularly with the introduction of Curry Sark. So the division of that is really back to kind of what it what used to be to some extent. Yeah, because I mean, listening to you and Kirsty the other night on Instagram, uh, it was quite interesting to see and listen to Kirsty talking about the ideas she's got and sort of cast management and things like that and, and looking into different casts. Because we all know the problems you had with, I believe it was the cider cask. Um, do you see... I know you're not going to release any more cider casks until things change. Um, but, you know, is there anything else in theory that you have that could still upset the SWA or not? Um, about it? <laughs> I, well, I, I honestly, I don't know because you know when we released the cider cask, we didn't think it would upset anybody. Yeah, you know, because we were looking at what was happening around us um, with some brands bringing out some really interesting expressions. Um, so I thought, you know, cider felt slightly safer. Yeah. Um, I do hope so. Uh, don't tell my bosses this. I know you're recording this, so I should maybe be set carefully. Because it felt great to be the bad boys of the whiskey industry for a change. <laughs> yeah. It was um, it was great because it you know like they say, like everybody says, no press is bad press. Um, we were, you know, when ScotchWhiskey.com was on the go. We were the number one red article for 10 days on the biggest whiskey site in the world. Yeah. You know, that kind of press and that publicity that we got off the back of it was fantastic. And to this day, um, the cider cask would have been our fastest selling expression ever. You know, whilst we were told to sell what we had, it didn't take very long for that to happen. Um, and that was an instance where Glen Murray sold out really quickly. And I'm, I'm not knocking the cider cask because um, I thought it was a fantastic whiskey. But we've had better whiskey sit on shelf for much longer. It was just the controversy around it which helped push it through um so yeah so from the point of view of um shining a light on glenn murray it was a, a great kind of period and i really quite enjoyed it you know our bosses maybe not so much but uh, <laughs> i thought it was good fun all publicity is good publicity as absolutely they say. yes yeah, yeah. Uh, we're, we're talking about the Stella Cask. Well, yeah, so um, yeah, it's funny. Belgium, isn't it? Yeah, speaking of Belgium, that, that, it was the town of Leuven. I spent my time in Belgium. So, uh, yeah, I know the Stella. Yeah, you, better not, you better not promote Stella, Ian. Yeah, no, I won't yeah. do <laughs> talking, talking about curiosity casks, uh, after the Rome Agricole one, um, I saw uh, something about... One. Yeah, that's what I was <laughs> going to ask. So, is it uh, coming to be released soon? What, can you says but we won't tell uh, what it is 
No, it was um, that Instagram discussion we had with Kirsty. So that uh, I've kind of, missed it, unfortunately. Uh, so I shopping. hope it was recorded, but I couldn't find a, a recording. That Christo, I'm t- I'm taking your uh, Glen Murray fanboy badge away from you. For <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry. My real life first stepped in, and it's it's, uh, it's a uh, shame. <laughs> so um, yeah, so this is a cask sample of the next uh, Curiosity release, which is a Madeira cask. Um, okay. Now. A lot of people will say, well, Madeira isn't um, particularly curious. There's a lot of Madeira cask whiskies out there. What is different about this one is it's a 13-year-old full maturation. So there isn't a lot of full maturation Madeiras available, not for that length of time anyway. So um, that, that 13 is... 13-year-old, you said? 1-3, yep, 13. Yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, add one for me in my, uh, in my shopping list, please. <laughs> will do. <laughs> Just jumping back to the masala cask, Ian, uh, yes. was that a dry or a sweet? Don't know. I uh, don't have provenance of it. Um, that's that's one which dates back um, a little bit longer than we were keeping. Uh, well, actually, no, was it? I'm trying to remember the length. No, that would have been more recently, so we probably could find out, but I, I honestly don't know. Yeah, it's just I, I've noticed on the chat one or two people were sort of wondering, uh, I think it was Andy, um, just wondering, but obviously, if we could find out and... Maybe yeah, I'll, 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 I'll ask the question and see if we can find out uh, and see what, what backstory we have on that cask. Really? So w- what I was kind of uh, kind of uh, hinting at there was some of the Glenmorangie era casks we have, we don't have a great deal of provenance off the back of that. Um, but this is a short finish, so it would have been more recent, so we should have some more detail for you. Uh, one more question that's come from Sophie. Um, you are allowed to ask it yourself, Sophie, but... Uh, do we know what the oh, what's in? I felt really rude. <laughs> um, well, you might as well ask it now. Now you spoke. <laughs> no. um, I was just wondering what your um, your average age was for your classic selection. Whether they were, I know you said that they were all aging between like five and nine, but is that for the entire series or is it? Yep. So the the entire series, we basically make the original classic. So we pull together a big batch of classic uh, and then we hive off smaller volumes and we transfer it into cask for finishing. So they're all the same age with the addition of the finishing process. The average age of the classic is five or six years. Now that's an average. So we've got younger stock and we've got older stock brought into the mix. Usually we're looking at, you know, um, four, six and eight years old, roughly. That's the usual breakdown of the classic. It's about there. Again, don't tell my bosses because we're not really meant to talk about that. But <laughs> they, they give me they give me this role of brand ambassador to educate and inform and say, can't tell them that, can't tell them that, can't tell them that. So uh, yeah, so don't. Yeah, tell them. and you said you liked to be the bad boys. So Absolutely, yes. <laughs> that's what you're doing right now. <laughs> not 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 so bad that they sack me. It's, it's a fine line. It's a fine line. <laughs> um, a question, S- uh, and question since it's not written on the label, you don't risk anything from SWA. <laughs> no, absolutely, yes, um, and also, uh, you know, to some extent, the, the age will vary. The age will yeah. change. You know, that's an average. Um, you know, basically, I know this is a kind of well-trodden path. People talking about non-age statement being flavor-led rather than age-led. To some extent, uh, some of that is marketing, but to some extent, some of that is true. You know, because if you are just sticking to a rigid set recipe of ages and kind of um, casks, you're going to find massive variation. Yeah. And, and what we try to do is we try and iron that variation out by maybe dipping into older, sometimes dipping into younger stocks if you can do. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, so you are kind of flavor led as much as age led. I know that so well. Okay. And how long is your finish length? So the finish length um, varies across the expressions um, with the longest finish being on the Cabernet, the red wine, it's 14 months. The shortest being the port, which is, I think about, it's average about eight to 10 months. The sherry, I think is about 12 months. So um, this is one area where we're looking at being a little bit more consistent. And this kind of um, probably uh, contradicts what I've just said, um, but we, you know, we were finding with the port in particular it had kind of ups and downs of port influence. Some of that was to do with bottling schedules, where you were maybe pulling it out a little bit sooner than you wanted to. Um, so we are looking to be a little bit more consistent around the finishing process. Uh, just on the port cascade, sorry, 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 mate. Um, I don't want to sort of draw it back to something that we started off talking about ages ago, but you obviously said that this was natural colour, which is fantastic. Yes. Um, 
and when I reviewed it the other day, all, all I could say was I wasn't sure because it doesn't say anywhere on the bottle. And I, I, didn't, I didn't get the normal box. I got the gift pack with these glasses because I needed some glasses, to be honest. I keep smashing them um, because I've, well, I just keep drinking too much, clearly. <laughs> um, and I was just wondering, I mean, is it sort of said anywhere on the box or anything? Because, I mean, I think what you were touching on before, people, I mean, not myself, and I'm assuming no one in this, this room sort of sees... Glen Murray um, in the supermarkets and things and you know I don't want to say they don't you know they're not going to take it seriously as such but you did sort of touch on the fact that people sort of overlook it a little bit and I think natural colour is definitely something that people should be shouting about and be really yeah. sort of proud of um, mm-hmm. is that something you're going to be putting on your packaging or factoring into the general presentation yes um, watch the space um, cool. Not maybe not immediately with the classic range or um, away from, um, but uh, moving into uh, the likes of the Curiosity range and things like that, which are all natural color. It's something which we didn't mention, which you kind of we felt we um, we should. So uh, going forward, there's going to be more of a, more clarity around certainly our limited releases around which is natural color. Not all of the classic range are natural color. Um, you know, we, the, the problem we sometimes have is that we get away with natural color and don't need to add it because we have a parameter for the color. Um, sometimes we will introduce color if we need to, particularly around the original classic, but it's, it's, it's not, we don't, we can't say for certain it is 100% natural color. So with the portwood, that one I can tell you is. Um, so hope that makes some sense. Just heading back, heading back earlier, you spoke about uh, about provenance for some of the casks. How difficult is it for you to find the provenance of all the casks you have? Is it mainly the older ones that you have issues with, or is it an ongoing issue where sometimes you're just not too sure? No, older ones uh, mainly. Um, you know that would you know, we, we when I say provenance, it's you know the how detailed do you want to go with your provenance is what I'm talking about. We know it's a sherry cask. We'll probably know it's Oloroso cask. We but we won't know which would be Dega it's from. We don't know um, how long it's been used for, um, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So the provenance is around about how many layers into that detail you want to go. Um, and we're, we're getting better at being much clearer on what we are uh, because a lot of the time the casks we're using are from our own businesses. So as a, as a buying of casks, do you try to buy used casks then or do you season them yourself at all? So we do have a mixture of um, proper casts. So within the port cast, we've got some port pipes and everything else um, that are, you know, full age, tawny port casks. We do do some seasoning as well, and we do it ourselves. So we season with our own products if we need to, to bring in to bulk up the stock. Do you know the length of seasoning or does that depend on what? I, I, it's, uh, I don't know personally, um, but I'm sure somebody within the business will know the length of seasoning we've got. Because it's sort of- in, terms of, in terms of sort of the cast management side, how long would you expect to be able to use a cast for? Do you have sort of certain time frames or limits for the uses of a cask? We will typically use a cask three times and each cask will be evaluated on its final matured product as to which direction it will take and where it goes. Um, And sometimes you'll get a cask which is still offering quite a lot so you will um, continue to use it. So it's all all based around each individual cask. Um, You know, having Kirsty on board, you know, solely focused on cask management now may mean that we take different approaches. Um, it's still too early to say that will be the case, but certainly, you know, she'll have a little bit more time in her hands to be able to focus in and review and decide how she wants to, to manage the wood in itself. That's something, um, that's something I wanted to, uh, sorry, Sean, um, again, <laughs> getting cut off. Um, someone I wanted to ask was about um, Kirsty coming in and what her wood management or wood policy would be. If Graham changed from second field to first field, and that's his preference. I was curious to know what, what she'd be doing, but um, still in the assessment phase. Yes, yeah, so you know, this whole situation has probably put the brakes so to some extent on what she can do because ultimately the cask set up here on Speyside and she is based down in Glasgow. So the opportunity to come up, you know, she was coming up every week. Um, she was sitting down with Duncan, our warehouse supervisor, um, and I sat in on a few sessions where we went through some casks. Um, so really, 
you know, it's too early. It, it would be about now. I think she would probably have a good handle on it if things were as they should be and as normality would suggest. But um, because of the current situation, it's maybe slipped back and we'll, we'll maybe see, it'll maybe take a few more months before we can see exactly what she thinks of the entire kind of stock profile. And a decision's probably best taken when you've got a, a, a broader feel for what we have. We're currently in the process of building her uh, lab on site which will mean as well that we can take samples and have them there waiting for her. So there's less time of just walking through warehouses and going that cask, that cask, that cask. So um, really we have to kind of adjust the infrastructure of what we have from a working capacity so that she has got um, somewhere to operate and um, you know, somewhere which is more suitable for operation. Right. Thank you. Can I just uh, piggyback on that question as well, because it's related. I, I know Ian, um, you have worked at Glenmarie for sort of around 14, 15 years now or something. Um, and I think Graham's tenure was, was quite similar. I, I don't know whether you crossed over with, with Ed Dodson at all, um, but uh, just given sort of how you've mentioned his approach to, um, I guess, how the, the kind of distillate character of, of Glen Murray is presented versus Graham's, um, and also that you've mentioned that I don't think you have any more sort of stock from the 70s left. How would you kind of compare the, um, you know, the, the distillate sort of back then and throughout Ed's tenure to, to maybe what Graham was, was producing? I, so well, we, Graham and I joined on the same week. He joined on the Monday and I joined on the Thursday. So, um, <laughs> you know, we, there was no crossover um, with Ed in my part or, or Graham's part, but he worked with Ed and, you know, spent a bit of time with him to understand the distillery, obviously. Um, the... The, the spirit character didn't change massively. Um, you know, Graham kept the cut points. Um, there was obviously a change to the capacity in the distillery. Uh, and there was a change to uh, the, the stills as well. You know, we changed our wash stills quite considerably. Ultimately, that had less of an effect than ultimately expected. Certainly from my point, I thought it was going to have a massive change. <laughs> Graham was quite adamant it would have a lesser change, and, and he was very right in that case. Um, How did the stills change? It, 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 it lost. Um, Glenmurray Spirit was really quite um, citrusy. Uh, it, it brought more of a kind of toffee sweetness to it, and there was ultimately a number of different areas for change there. You know, we changed our fermentation type, uh, our fermentation time, should I say, sorry. Uh, so we're now at 60 hour fermentation. So when Ed was running the distillery and for a period of time where Graham was, we had a 44 hour fermentation time. So that's going to influence the character slightly. We had a change to the size of the, the, the wash stills. We went from um, 8,000 litre wash stills to 17 and a half thousand litre wash stills. Spirit stills pretty much kept the same, although we did convert the wash stills to spirit stills, the smaller ones, but ultimately they were kind of similar size and shape. They weren't hugely different. Um, so that, that had an effect on the character. So it's hard to pinpoint the one area that had the effect because there was quite a few changes to the distillery over the time um, that Graham was involved. Um, with um, Ross coming on board, um, he's very studious. You know, I used to be able to rattle off our mashing uh, volumes and uh, weights of uh, grist. I don't know at the moment what it is because it's changing almost on a weekly basis. As he gets a feel for it and as he decides what he's going to do, um, we've changed our barley type. It changed a couple of times with Graham, um, but Ross was quick to change it to Laureate. Uh, so that's another change that was made. Um, which I think what else has changed in the time. Uh, within production. He's currently looking at the, the cleaning regime and things like that and what we do and how we work it. So, so there's a few kind of tweaks being made. I think, you know, Ed had the distillery up and running to a T. So I don't think it was really, other than the changes to the volume and the capacity, you know, there really wasn't much with, with the changeover from um, Ed to Graham, to be honest. Um, uh, Oh, sorry. Uh, so, so, Soren said earlier, I think you um, you were you're producing 5.7 million litres. Was that a, a year? Um, so, yeah. So the distillery was actually um, expanded over two expansion programs. The first expansion program um, really exhausted all available space to us in respect of, we, you know, we fitted in a few extra stills without having to add a new building. 
So that took us up by 50% uh, from 2.2 to 3.3 million litres. That was completed in about 2012, 2013. Um, we then knocked down the old maltings. We had an old salad and box maltings at the back of the distillery, which uh, ceased production in 1977. Uh, that by knocking that down, that gave us the footprint to expand the distillery by building new buildings by kind of uh, really increasing the, the the volume that way. So that was completed in 2016, and that took us up to a capacity of six million liters. However, that volume was not required, so we were only producing at the 5.4, 5.7 million capacity until 2019. Um, when we, sorry, 2018, where we went to, sorry, no, 2019, I'm saying, mm -hmm. 2019, where we actually pushed it to 6 million litres. This year, we've knocked it back to 5.4 million litres. So we've pulled back a little bit on where we were. And a, a follow up to that, sorry, is um, how much of that goes into your own single malt and, and or after other, other brands that you've got, you mentioned the other, other blends? So it's it's a moving target, obviously, because we, we don't know how we're going to sit with curry sark and we don't know um, how that recipe and that's going to perform. That's part of the reason we pushed it to 6 million litres. Um, with curry sark, when we bought the brand, we bought three years worth of stock, so uh, there'll be no change to it. We've now also um, put in place a reciprocal agreement with Glen Rothis because Glen Rothis is the backbone to curry sark, so we will continue to keep that is the keystone malt within the blend. Okay. Um, but on average, the figure that Graham used to quote, I've not, not spoken to Kirsty if this is changing, but Graham certainly quoted, um, it was about two thirds uh, blend, uh, one third single malt. So that would be, it's six million, four and two. Okay, thank you. So you kind of touched a little bit on it in there, Ian, that uh, currently you're doing a 60 hour fermentation. Um, do you see, firstly, do you see that changing at all or will, does it look like you'll stick at the 60 hours? I, th I think we're going to stick there. Um, um, certainly not heard any rumblings. Who knows? You know, we are in a time of flux because we've got change of um, personnel um, and different ideas and different thought process, processes. So ultimately, you know, I won't say with 100% certainty, yeah. it, it would be at the behest of, of Ross if he decides to change things. I mean, the, the next part of the question, sort of, obviously, I think all your washbacks are outside, aren't they? They are now, yes. And do you have, this is kind of going to be a two-part question depending on what you answer to this first part, but is there, is there a reason and have you seen any difference from putting them outside? I, well, the, the, the reason is space. Um, yeah. You know, we, the reason we had a 44-hour fermentation is because we had a, a real kind of pinch point within the production process at fermentation, you know, because we only had four interior washbacks and no room to put any more. So um, ultimately, uh, space was the, the deciding factor to push, push them outside. Um, as far as change, no. Um, visual, aesthetic. Yeah. It, it looks, it, you know, honestly speaking, it looks more industrial. Um, process speaking, no change. Okay. We, we have to be careful with the ambient temperature on transfer of the wort moving yeah. from inside to outside. Um, but once you've got the, the yeast in and once it's active and working, um, the, 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 the outdoor washbacks are insulated, the heat and the energy is retained and the fermentation will continue regardless. You've, you've kind of led perfectly into the second question now. Now, I'm not sure whether you will answer this one or whether you can or whether it's just something that's not been spoken about. But I was recently listening to um, a couple of chaps from Glenmorangie and they went on to the line and, and very briefly discussed about temperature controlled fermentation and the merits and, and sort of obviously that I know in the SWA we don't really do it. Um, but is, is this anything that has been discussed before or recently? Nope, nope. I've, I've no. never been involved or heard of a discussion regarding temperature control. You know, around fermentation, the approach for experimentation has always been around yeast types. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, certainly not, not a conversation I've been a part of or um, heard anything about, to be honest. So, Are you enjoy. doing much experimenting with yeast? Not, not at time being, no, but it has been brought up. I know it was something Graham was uh, considering, um, along with a couple other things. So, um, you know, whether that appetite is still there within the business, then we have to wait and see. Um, one of the questions earlier as well, I can't remember who actually asked it, but 
Um, somebody mentioned the PPM levels. I believe you're around the 50 PPM. So we dropped it back this year to the original PPM of the first uh, batch that we did. So back in 2010, we were down at uh, low 40s, I think about 42. Um, and after that, it was pushed up to 50s. Um, but for some reason, and I asked the question um, of the guy on site that um, reports directly, on, sorry, I said guy, that's, that's very unfair because it's a woman, um, mm -hmm. girl on site who's reporting into Ross and managing these things as to why or if, he, if she knew what the decision was about pulling it back. Um, she didn't know, but she was going to ask that question because it was something which interested me as if what was the thinking behind going back to the original PPM. I know that um, Graham wanted to bring a little bit more smoke to it. So yeah. um, we'll, we'll wait and see what, what the thinking is behind that. And is it a local peat you use? Aberdeenshire. Yeah, yeah, so Reasonably local. Um, and what, what sort of amount of Peter, are you doing? Is it still around the hundred thousand liter mark? Or yep, it's about there. So we um, we ran for ten days uh, from the eighth of March to the eighteenth, or was it the eighteenth to the twenty eighth? There was eights involved anyway. It was sometime <laughs> in March. I, I wasn't there. Um, I missed out on it. I um, I love being there during the Peter run uh, because the, the whole kind of um, the whole ambience of the distillery changes because the, the aroma changes. You know, as soon as you walk into the malt store, you know, changing from peated stock to non-peated stock, it's, it's, it's amazing the effect it has. Um, and, and I love touring during the peated run uh, because it, it brings to life, you know, an aspect of the process. You know, you, you can smell a non-peated run, but people don't make the connection. Um, but when you've got that peat malt sitting in the store and then you take them into the mill room where they can smell the smoke still lingering and then you take them up to the mash tun where the, the smoke is still there, you know, it, it creates that connection and creates a better thread, um, you know, mentally within people as they're walking around the distillery, I feel. So I always love doing a tour when it's peated run, but unfortunately this year that was not possible. How big is the clean down afterwards then? I, well, normally we go into our um, shutdown for maintenance. This year we didn't, so we actually kept running. And this was a, a process that Graham had been doing for a couple of years, uh, not having the clean down. We did initially. Um, after that, he kept running. So the, um, the uh, phenols would basically purge themselves over a couple of weeks. So yeah. you were getting a kind, of de a kind of degrading level of, of smokiness within your batches. Um, this year we weren't going to do that, but we're going to go back to removing the four shots and feints, putting them into IBC, putting them into storage and bringing them out the following year oh, after yeah. a clean down and maintenance. But because our maintenance period wasn't um, possible, because all the contractors and the engineers and everything who would be working on site couldn't come on to site, uh, we decided to keep running. So this year we're going to go for clean down, um, but we didn't, but typically that's what we've been doing anyway. And so do you think you will use any of that de um, decreasing levels of peat as a, as a standalone um, expression, or do you think it will just get blended together? I think, it'll, I think it'll just get blended together. Ultimately for us, um, peating was the driving force and the, the, the factor behind um, introducing a peated run into Glen Murray was for label five. Um, yeah because 2% of the, the malt component within label five, the classic black, is uh, peated stock. Um, prior to that, we were getting it from a Speyside distillery, which ran a peated run. Um, you can work that out if you want. Um, so when, we, when they took over Glen Murray, they basically decided, well, we can start producing that uh, in-house. So we started it in 2010. So um, blending ultimately is the, the main output for peated stock. So um, whether that is the, the kind of reducing influence as well, can't say with 100% certainty, but I would think it would be. Yeah. And is, is there many new styles of peated whiskey that are going to come out? Obviously, we've had the sherry, we've had the classic peated, um, the masala. You know, have you got anything lined up to come out soon or...? Yeah, I think Kirsty is currently looking at peated in particular um, because we're sitting on some stock that we have available to us that's coming off a, a decent age, 10 years old. So I think she's looking at whether um, that is something we can do. 
Um, in particular, around the core range, I think during that Instagram session, I did ask her whether she was planning tweaking the core range anyway. Mm. Um, she was kind of a little bit vague on it, but you know, one area that you know I, I know has been in, uh, discussed, with, uh, not not necessarily kind of in a formal kind of for uh, formal kind of forum, um, but the the current peated classic is seventy five percent peated, twenty five percent non peated, and the reason for that was always because within the classic there was older stock. Yeah. You, know, you had to dip into the eight, nine year old stock to form the kind of rounded character that created it. And um, we didn't have eight, nine year old peated stock. So we dipped into non peated stock. Mm. So we're now in a situation where we could make the peated classic 100% peated. So, you know, those are the kind of, you know, options that she now has available to her that, that weren't available previously. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot can happen with Pete and Glenn Murray. So um, again, it's a case of watch this space and see what happens. So I presume if you did that, though, that would actually ramp up the peated level in it a little bit. Absolutely. Is that, is that the idea? Well, if, if you were to do it, that would be the idea. You know, ultimately, yeah. that would be the, 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 the result. So you'd have to take it with that as, as an approach. Whether that would fit with the classic range, um, the ethos behind the classic range is always about accessibility. Yeah. And that, that is from a pricing as well as a flavor format you know, creating whiskies within the flavor spectrum that are accessible to all. You know, the sherry cask is not heavily sherry to the point where it's so spicy that you, you can't yeah. taste anything else. Yeah. The port cask doesn't bring any of the tannic elements of port, which brings that leathery bitter finish that comes through that can sometimes polarize people. And the peated is soft and gentle. You know, it's a peated whiskey, which non-peated whiskey drinkers can get into. So whether, we, whether we'd want to break that ethos to create a 100% peated classic, who knows? As I say, you know, these are kind of general conversations rather than in a more kind of um, formalized forum where that is the direction. So it's, it's options that are open to us, not necessarily options that we will take. So it's, it's a case of letting Kirsty um, bed in. Um, giving her a proper run at things where she can actually spend time at the distillery um, yeah. and see what happens from there. Because I know one of the exciting things that obviously I asked the question the other night um, was the fact that she was looking to use a bit more virgin oak as well. Um, so, you know, that's going to be interesting. Obviously, we're probably looking at maybe five years time before we really see the, the benefits of that. But is there, is there much virgin oak stock on site? Or? Yeah, we have virgin oak. We've got virgin oak, uh, virgin American oak, and we've got virgin French oak as well. So not massive volumes, um, but stuff of, of a decent enough age now that she could look at doing something with. Yeah. Um, Christoph's got a question for you. I'll let him, because we can't normally shut him up, so he might as well do it himself. Yeah, um, I, I, as you know, I want to interrupt again. Um, <laughs> Uh, I was wondering, do you know, Ian, um, how many percent uh, roughly of your production goes into the Elgin Classic range, uh, into Butterly Roads and uh, or other distillery exclusives and uh, into blends? I, so as I said earlier, you know, whether it's changed, I don't know, but certainly Graham used to always quote the kind of two thirds to one third single malt to blends. Um, as far as a breakdown in the individual expressions, um, that's something you would have to ask one of our sales guys. Um, they, they would probably have a better idea as to, I try and avoid talking sales. <laughs> I, 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 I don't like to come across as a salesman. Um, I, I just like to talk about whiskey. So I'm assuming by that you mean around 2 million litres for the single malt, 4 million for the... Um, laid down, yeah, yep, laid down. Yeah, okay. I mean, two million liters for the single malt is still a hefty amount, though. Yeah, yeah, that's quite impressive. Yeah, ultimately, you know, that uh, I use the word laid down. You know, ultimately, that's probably not the the percentage breakdown when it comes to sales. But, you know, we have we have got a lot of gaps to fill in stock, so some of that's got to sit down for a, a long, long period of time. Um, you know, we don't have a huge amount of age stock, particularly in the higher ages. This year, we're getting a little bit of a loosening of that where we're able to bring a 30-year-old to the range. Um, you know, for many years, our 25-year-old that we were selling was actually 29-year-old stock because that's all we had to that fill that. that expression. <laughs> yeah, uh, I saw that uh, one of the 25 pot hoods, uh, I guess... Uh, 
the 1988 vintage. Yep. Uh, there was some bottles back in 2018. So it was almost 29 or, 20 or 30 years old. Yes, so that was the only kind of parcel of stock that we had of an age profile. And the 25 was a very popular release, so the company decided to continue doing it. But ultimately, we were bottling older stock at a, a younger age because we didn't have 25-year-old stock. Uh, so I, I that, may have a bid uh, right now on a 27, I bought wood, but... <laughs> it's, it's great. And it's, you know, that, that was one thing, you know, where I think, um, you know, again, Glenn Murray was proving great value for money. You were getting... Uh, 29 year old bottled as 25 for the mm. price of something which was even cheaper than a lot of 25 year olds so you know that was um, another great selling point of our whiskey um so that kind of little kind of collection of stock that we were bottling has come of age to 30 so this year we will obviously take that um decision to bottle as a 30 right and i've, I've tried kirsty's um kind of mix of the 30 that we're going to be releasing and it's amazing it's great um it's a mix of um, port and sherry stock uh and it really i've tried it at cask strength i've not tried it at the reduced 46 which it'll probably be at but at cask strength it was lovely so well um, if you can good. hide a sample of it cask strength so I, 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 I wouldn't mind i, I, think, <laughs> I think i finished uh, I, I, that one uh, another another question regarding the 25 port hood. Uh, if I'm correct, I read uh, earlier this year or maybe end of last year that you are going to release another 25 port hood. Uh, what I'm surprised about is that last year you released the 21 port hood. Uh, so I was surprised to see two releases of kind of the same thing but with different ages yeah so um the 25 uh was laid to bed for a couple of years um we didn't bring one out um the 21 was brought in ultimately to replace it and the 25 then made a uh, a resurgence and we took it back out because it was what we were getting asked a lot for it um, people liked the 25 and so Kirsty pulled together so really the new 25 is for is the first kind of proper Kirsty release that we've, we've had okay. um, and she, she took a very different approach to the 21 so while there are similarities in you know the styling as in the fact that it's a port wood finish and it's of an older age she took a, a different approach to Graham and brought something which has got a very much lighter style to it. So we've got it here. I've got a bottle of it here. It's the 1994 um, Portwood Finish 25-year-old. Um, and it's a wonderfully elegant one. And um, so I can't remember, I think it was Soren had mentioned earlier about bringing, you know, having a finish where, you know, you're not finishing for the sake of it. And this is one where certainly the bourbon cask carries a lot of the load within it and the port cask is a much softer influence whereas the 21 is very port forward the port is is very much the dominant feature of the whiskey so um we we brought it out unexpectedly i thought the 25 had, had its day um but we brought it back and i think it's nice to have and it's it's great that we took a very kind of yin and yang approach with something quite so similar so um they are very different whiskies despite their similarity on the face of things so just jumping slightly, sorry, uh, just jumping slightly backwards because there's a couple of questions that have come in. Um, the first one will lead into the second one quite nicely. So um, one of the questions is what what are the blends that Glen Marie normally go into? Obviously, we know there's label five. Um, and then the second part of the question was, can you sort of give us a little bit more information on the Starlaw Distillery because. I'm pretty sure not many people have either heard of it or know much about it. And is there actually any releases directly from that distillery itself? So uh, to answer your first question, um, two main blends we have are Label 5. Uh, this is the ninth biggest selling Scotch whisky in the world. Um, over uh, 40 million bottles to 100 different markets globally. Um, so that is really the, the biggest one that Glen Murray contributes to. Um, it's, it's a great one. It's got a number of different expressions. The classic black is just a nice, easygoing mixing blend. 
um, you know, you'll pick it up in most supermarkets, particularly in France. Um, you know, it's an everyday blending. Whiskey. Yeah, it's one of the biggest uh, settings in France. Yeah. Yep. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I guess it's in the top five, I would say. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure where it sits in France uh, individually. <laughs> I, but, I uh, must admit, I didn't ever buy one, but um, sorry about that. <laughs> it's it, it's it's really it's all right. It's a great great whiskey, and the um you know the the aged expressions they do. Uh, so there is um, a twelve year old and an eighteen year old within. I've it. never never seen them seen them uh, anywhere, but uh... they also did. I'm trying to see if I can find it. I've got one on my shelf somewhere. Um, I can't see it. They did a, a blended malt uh, called Label Fifty Five a number of years ago, which was was really nice. Um, okay, you know, slightly, slightly ahead of the curve, probably before the likes of um, a Monkey Shoulder and things like that were popular. But um, yeah, it was really nice. So yeah, so um, Label Five is the key one. I uh, followed by Sir Edwards, um, one which you know. I've only ever worked with, you know, my role as brand ambassador is the whiskey brand ambassador for the company. I do have to work with the blends as well as the single malts. You know, for the past week, I've probably done more Cutty Sark tastings than I have done Glen Murray tastings. Um, but Sir Edwards is one that I've probably worked with the least. Um, it's actually quite big in Israel. So I got to go out to Israel and do um, a little bit of work out there with that one. They've actually just released or about to release a beer cask which I got sent a bottle in the post last week, uh, Beer Reserve, um, which I had a couple of glasses off the other night, which is really nice. So, so look out for that. So that's some Glen Murray and Beer Cask going into there as well. Uh, not sure, not had the exact details of the breakdown of what the blend is, details on that one, but coming soon. Um, and obviously now Curry Sark, which, you know, going forward, Glen Murray will play a part in ultimately, but for the time being, the recipe and the setup of curry is as is, as it was with um, Edrington. So, you know, those are our three main blends uh, that we work with. Uh, there was another question. I oh, single grain, Starlaw. Yes. So Starlaw is our grain distillery based in Bathgate. Um, really, really um, interesting place to be. Um, as part of, of my early training, I got to work there for two weeks um, and really kind of fascinating to get a kind of a, a kind of grain aspect of things and see how they work. You know, I have spent some time up at um, Invergordon. In fact, I, I studied a bit up there on distillation. So, um, uh, but really to get under the kind of bonnet of a grain distillery is fascinating. Um, Starlaw has got an annual production capacity of about 25 million litres. Um, it's a, a new grain distillery, the first grain distillery built in Scotland since the 1960s. It's been set up to be interchangeable between wheat and maize. Uh, so it can switch between the two quite easily. Some distilleries, the older distilleries, because they have different waste, you know, they can only deal with one style, so we can switch between them. It's Star Law, L-A-W. Um, and a, what more can I say about it? Um, the grain's quite young at the moment. It's only about, what was it, 2009, I think it started operating. So we're looking at 11 years old. So some of the older expressions that we do within blends, we had to buy the grain in. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, can you get a Star Law? Uh, not at the moment. They did release a single cask um, to staff um, and rather infuriatingly um, um, it was only available to staff that worked at the distillery. So I never got one um, and I really desperately wanted one. Um, so I was kind of gutted. Uh, but yeah, so you can get one at auction. Some of these yeah. not, naughty members of staff that maybe decided to sell their bottle. Um, I was tempted to buy one at auction but I was too, too, too stubborn for that. I'm like, no way, if you're not giving me one, I'm not paying for it. <laughs> so it's interesting to know then that you're doing both wheat and maize because a lot of the distilleries have obviously gone away from the maize side and sort of predominantly wheat. So is it uh, a local maize or do you know? Um, is it I'll be honest with you, I don't know. You know, the distillery has been set up to be able to switch between the two. Whether they readily do, um, 
I'd need to speak to Ross and find out, you know, it was, was years that I was down there when it was wheat at the time they were running. I think the option is there, but whether if they do or not, I, I can't say with uh, certainty. So I'd need to speak to some of the team. And is that purely to uh, make the grain for, for yourselves, you know, for your own blends, or is that, is that being sold to other people as well then? Again, another question, good question, which I don't know the answer to. Um, I don't know whether use it. I think they were using it for reciprocal agreements, um, but I wouldn't like to say with a definite certainty. Not a side of the business I'm too closely involved in. Um, so, yeah, Christoph, so I think we've answered the one Christoph was going to. Um, but going back, um, I think Frank has a, a question for you, going back to the whiskey side, unless anybody else has got anything on the grain side before we go off that. I've just seen that uh, was I was looking for the Starlow. I I saw it was on Scottish here whiskey auctions in 2017, not at cask strength, so I don't know if it was a single cask or not, and it went for 270 quid. Yep, that's right. That sounds about right to me. It was a single cask, and they had reduced it. Uh, okay. But um, yep, so that was just given to staff at the production facility down there. Not they must have got a fair bit each then. I. Yeah, I suppose they would have done. I suppose if you, there, there might be a bottle in a cupboard somewhere. I'm going to have to resurrect, me, please. <laughs> um, right, we'll go back to Frank. Do you want to ask your question? Yes, I was wondering, uh, what's the oldest cask you have uh, in your warehouses? And are you planning to, uh, to release uh, very old uh, expressions of uh, Glen Moray? Yeah, so we're sitting on two casks of 1978. There's not a lot of liquid in there. Um, you know, the, one of the sessions that I did get to sit down with Kirsty before this kicked off, we, we did taste it. Um, and, um, you know, that was a very tough morning. Uh, I really kind of, I was going to complain to HR about that, but I thought better not. Um, it was stunning. It was really lovely. Um, 42 years old. Um, it's just it's at the point of where it, it's a perfection I think um, probably Mastery is probably my favourite all time Glen Murray um, it was very expensive um, but I think this will push it pretty damn close so what the what, cast mix of Mastery Ian? so the cast mix of Mastery was um, don't ask me the dates because I've forgotten them because it's that long since I've had to work with Mastery um, whiskey has that effect on the brain, um, but I can't remember. It was a, a bourbon cask. It was two Madeiras, uh, sorry, two Sherry's, one Port, one Madeira. Um, I think it was 77, 84, and 94. Don't quote me on those dates, but that's what I, I vaguely remember them being. Um, so I'm talking of 77, I think I was up um, with you about three or four years ago, and was I think one of the samples that I had a taste of was that not a 77? Is it the large? Yes, so 77. Again, you're picking on the, the, the kind of things that I'm quite bitter about within our business, you know, the <laughs> not, not getting a star law and 77. So I, you know, um, I was born in 77 and we released the 1977 single cask which I worked on all the packaging. I developed it and worked with an agency and we'd done it. And I was super, super excited by this and we released it. Um, and I was gonna buy a bottle and I was like, and it was expensive, it was about 350 pounds a bottle. So I um, decided, right, I'll wait, okay, I'll get one of them later on. And we were selling uh, maybe about two or three a month, something like that. It was when, when we weren't that busy at the visitor center, things were a little bit quieter. Um, and we had about 20 on stock on shelf and i went off on holiday and thought right when i come back i'm buying um a 1977 and and i'll name the guy because he's a very good friend of mine and he was one of our guides um a fantastic guide that we had called alan ironside he's now the brand ambassador for uh, ballantines in india um and just a really super super nice guy but this time i kind of came close to, to, to hanging him. I came back from holiday and we'd had a load of these on the shelf, was going to be buying it. And he kind of came bursting out to me like, like a kid at Christmas and was like, oh, did you hear, did you hear? I sold all of those 1977s to one customer. And he was super delighted. So I never got one. I oh, missed out on that bottle. 
Um, so I didn't get one. So yes, you, you would have tasted a sample of a 77 single cask. Yeah. Um, but again, it ties into one of those things I'm slightly bitter about that I never got. I was about to say, I think I've still got, because I know on the day uh, you poured us, I think one for me and one for the wife, and she was driving, so obviously I managed to take her sample away. And I'm just looking. Um, I did think I had one ready here to pour out, but I think I've actually drunk it. <laughs> It was lovely. It was such a nice dram. Um, it was it was a refill cask, um, not something I would normally um, you know go for. You know, I normally it was painted, like, wasn't it? Well, in seventy seven, would have been the last kind of batch of casks or uh, kind of period of time where um, Glen Murray had their own maltings. Back when we had our own maltings, Glen Murray was very lightly peated. I would never ever call it a peated whiskey. Mm -hmm. um, the level of peating was that, sorry. really low, uh, but ultimately you, you could say there was a peated element to it. So if anybody has a bottle of the Glen Murray 30 year old, uh, the old wooden box 30, which was from 74 stock, there is a kind of subtle hint of smokiness, which yeah. brings a kind of nice extra layer to the whiskey. Uh, so some old Glen Murrays have this kind of... I was going to say, because I've got the um, the Glen Murray 30 from um, Murray McDavid, yep. and I swear there, there is a small amount of smoke in there. Any, anything post uh, pre-77 will yeah. probably have a subtle hint of smoke to it, um, because yeah. that was the style of the distillery at the time. When were those uh, smoking used until, Ian? Uh, 77. Uh, so they were opened in 54 uh, and ran till 77. So Adrian's asked about the casks, the 78 casks, uh, what casks are they? They're bourbons, um, they're, they're hogsheads. I don't know um, whether they're first, second, I think they must be second or third fills. Uh, there's something, so it's a lighter kind of uh, character. Mm -hmm. Don't know the exact details around it. Just got the opportunity to try them. And then Sophie's asking the ABV, but I'm not sure. Is that for the mastery, Sophie? Or... Yeah, turn your, turn your mute off. <laughs> Oops, sorry. The, uh, the older casks, the oldest casks that you have, you said that you tasted them with Kirsty. I was just wondering the ABV because you said that there wasn't a lot of liquid left. And I wondered if as, as long as that sits and it's just going to get higher and higher, or lower yeah. and lower. Yeah, I, again, again, I don't because it was cask samples. Uh, we hadn't had them gauged, so um, when we would gauge them prior to bottling, uh, I think that there there must be enough strength in there for us to bottle them still. Uh, but what it is okay. at the moment, I don't know. Okay. Did you plan to vat them, Ian, or release them separately? We'd be bringing the two together because there's not enough volume in a single cask of what's left. One in terms question. of where, where we're talking about ABV, obviously you mentioned that the 30 year old is going to come out in sort of 46. With Kirsty coming in from Distel, where the sort of core ranges are in the 46 bracket, is there any talk of doing anything like that with Glen Murray? I certainly we will be looking at doing a little bit more. Um, within core range, we have a, a separation of the ranges. You know, the classic will never be, um, you know, the, the, the approach of it is, you know, affordability, accessibility, bringing it up in yeah. strength would make it more expensive for a start, but it would also um, polarize drinkers. So, you know, that, that is a range which doesn't really suit um, that kind of level of ABV. Um, yeah. Although to be fair, the classic you can buy um, as a duty-free exclusive at 46% uh, ABV. So we do have a classic at a higher ABV and it's actually quite nice. I, I really like it. Uh, it works quite well. So um, you can get it, um, but within the, the regular release of the classic, it's not an approach. Within the kind of heritage range, again, as I say, I asked that question of Kirsty. You know, these weren't kind of pre-planned questions. Uh, you know, so a lot of them was just me trying to find out, you know, from my own knowledge, um, whether she had any plans to change or play around with the core range. And she was a little bit cagey on it. So we'll see. We have to wait and see what the kind of plans are for the likes of the heritage range with the 12, 15, the 18 is already non-chill filtered. I think now the approach, whilst it's not been said overtly or outrightly, um, I think the plan with the, the core range is anything above 18 will definitely be uh, non-chill filtered. However, on saying that the new 25 is non-chill filtered, but I think that will change going forward. 
I mean, while we're sort of talking about ABV, one thing that I remember on one of the tastings, um, Graham had, had sort of let us know that he'd been experimenting a little bit with whiskey going into the cask, I think for finishing purposes, at, was it 50%? Um, do we know if there is much of that happened or whether it'll still go forward or whether it was just a few casks? So I, I think I'm, we, we must be connected in some way because as you were saying that, I picked up a bottle. I picked yeah. up a bottle 98 and that, yeah. wasn't, that wasn't planned. And I think this is going to be a bottle kill. So this is going to be a, a tearful moment for Look me. Look at that. Um, so yes, go on. Done. Finished. Damn. Um, 98 uh, PX cask. So this is um, one of those um, experiments that you had. I think stunning. I absolutely love this whiskey. Um, this is not my first bottle kill of this and it won't be my last because this is a great example. And that kind of, I shouldn't complain because as, as a Glen Murray drinker, I'm, I'm quite happy. I can still go to the visitor center and get a bottle of this, but it's been out for a year and a half. Um, and it's stunning. And it still surprises me that this is not just flown off the shelves. Yep, that one. How much is and, that? So this one is a 115 a bottle. It's a 19 year old PX cask finish. And it's that experiment with finishing that um, Soren had mentioned, where when the whiskey was taken out of the bourbon barrel, and transferred into the PX cask, it was reduced at transfer. So it was brought down to 50% to go into the PX cask. Now the science behind that, basically what you're looking at is that the lower the ABV, the kind of more interaction with the wood you're looking to increase. So you're gonna have more of the PX coming through as a result, and it creates just this wonderfully elegant, but full rich whiskey. Uh, where you're getting all the flavor that you get from a single cask whiskey at cask strength without any of that peppery burn to it. So this is one which you drink as is. You don't reduce, you don't no. drop off with any water. And it's, it's 45 ABV. Uh, 45 point, uh, I've forgotten, 45.5. Yeah. Um, Non-chill filtered, so below 46%. So ultimately you do run the risk of, of getting a little bit of sediment and cloudiness in this um, because it's not above 46, um, but it works, re works really well. Um, yeah. it's, it's like a liqueur. You know, the PX just absolutely comes right out of the glass, not only on the nose, but on the taste. And it just brings all the kind of rich fruit to it without, as I say, any of that peppery burn. It's just, it's, it's a wonderfully elegant whiskey, this one. I think the thing I know is that Ian. Mm -hmm. How long I think that the thing, finish? Sorry, go on. Four years. I think the thing I noticed with this 98 was that the first time I tried it, um, I was disappointed with it, to be honest with you, because um, I think I was comparing it to the 94. But it was one of those that after probably two or three weeks of the bottle being opened, it just transformed into what I kind of call a chocolate bomb. Yep. Um, it, it's, it's just, it just, the flavors just suddenly exploded on it. And like you say, it is a phenomenal drink, but it did take quite a while for it to open up. Yeah, you know, it's one which I find, you know, the longer it's open, the quicker it empties. It's, um, you know, if you give it that time and you give it that kind of breathing space, I think it does work well. You know, initially, I came into it very much from, and, and I, think, I, think we, I think the first time you tasted it would have probably been during a tweet tasting, is that correct? And it, it was a different ABV one too. Well, we brought it out, we kind of brought out, uh, no, that one would have been pretty much almost the same because it was just prior to bottling. Um, but uh, I, I approached it from the same approach as a cast strength whiskey. Mm. And ultimately, we, we looked at the, the kind of legality around it and whether it was still a cast strength whiskey. And it was a very gray area. Um, and I'm kind of glad that we didn't take the decision to, you know, have the wording cast strength on it, because ultimately we, I think we probably could have legally, um, because I think it needs to be approached as its own unique creature, its own unique beast, because it doesn't bring all the kind of intensity to the table that you will get with a single cask cast strength whiskey. 
Um, but it's got a lot of character to it and a lot of body. Um, particularly, I like the fact that the non-chill filtered at the lower ABV, um, you're getting that lovely kind of viscosity and thickness to it without any of the bite. Um, and it's very much an after dinner. Um, mm. This is, you, you know, I, I, I like to... I approach whiskies in a very kind of seasonal approach. You know, I think there are certain whiskies I'll drink in the summer and certain whiskies I'll drink in the winter. And this is very much winter kind of Christmassy, lovely kind of fruity, full on yeah. flavors. Um, and I just, I, I came to love this whiskey. Like yourself, I was a little bit unsure of it on the first mm. approach, particularly because it was brought out at the same time as a peated PX, which was very much the opposite end of the scale. Yeah. It was very much, all about the aggression and the intensity and the full on the nature that you expect within a single cast cast strength whiskey. Yeah. And I lent more into that one initially. I was like, you know, that's my favorite of the two. Over time, this has kind of taken over and I've learned yeah. to appreciate this as something a little bit different, a little bit unique because of that approach within the cask finishing. Now it's a long, long way of getting around to your, your question was, have we got any more? I don't know. I, we, I don't know which ones were filled in this way. And I don't know if there's a way of tracking it. And we'll need to check with Kirsty, whether it's something which is visible in the system to show whether it's been reduced prior to filling. So I'm sure there yeah. will be some way of tracking it. I mean, I think Ed just sort of asked, um, was it on the length of the finish? Did you say four years? Mm -hmm. And this is a question I obviously asked Kirsty the other night, which is a question I've asked a few people recently, and everybody has given me a different answer. When do you change it from being a finish to a maturation? Because four years to me is a second maturation. It's not a finish. A finish to me is six, you know, six months to a year. Once you get past that year and you've had all four seasons, depending on the age of the initial whiskey, obviously, it then kind of becomes um, a maturation. And it's interesting to know how people class it as a finish, even though it's for, because I think the 94 was six years, wasn't it? Yes, yeah, so, uh, five, or, five or six years, yeah. if I remember correctly. So it's interesting to see how people differentiate the difference between them. So you, you it was, I couldn't remember it was you that asked the question. Yeah. But I was actually surprised by your answer. You know, I, I, I have a different opinion than Kirsty. Um, my, my feeling is that a finish should be a shorter percentage of the initial maturation. Yeah. So once you near, you know, 40, 50%, I think we're in the realms of double maturation. In yeah. my opinion, that, that is, as my opinion, um, I think a finish should be a, a smaller percentage of the original maturation. I mean, do you think there's a detrimental side to which which you call it do, do people prefer a finish or do people prefer a double maturation i mean it, sh should there be any difference between them i, I think with finish you, you're kind of moving into a kind of more modern parlance within whiskey conversation because most finishes typically tended to be on the shorter end of the scale but as distilleries are finding themselves in a situation with maybe some stocks that have sat in a cask longer than they'd maybe planned or, you know, they just didn't know what to do with it. They're probably falling into the realms of double maturation. It's not an, a kind of older um, vocabulary that's used within whiskey, I don't think. So mm. I think it, for the time being, I think it confuses things. Um, long term, as it becomes more of a regular occurrence, then who knows? I think maybe we may be in a position where we want to be a little bit more clear on what it is. I think I think what we need to do is wait for the SWA to kind of rule upon the different regulations. And once that is is more of a hard and fast rule, and then you have everybody following the same route, I think then that would mean that it's clearer and yeah. less confusing. Because what you've got now is a lot of different people with different opinions um, and all with different influences within their businesses. So ultimately what you could find is a kind of, everybody doing their own thing and it become confusing. Yeah. So I think, I think for the time being, finish is probably a good a phrase as any. And, and it goes back to the fact that if we go back to our PX collection, the peated PX is 50-50. Now I worked on that packaging, but I am of the opinion that that is a double maturation, but yeah. decided to go with finish because it's more kind of recognized terminology. Yeah. I mean, one question that I think has come up, um, I'm not sure whether it was the 98 because I've lost it now, but um, was these distillery exclusives, um, 
I know that I have bought direct, sort of rung you up and pestered you into sending me one. Um, is it commonly available for people ringing up or is it really meant to be just for people coming to the distillery? Well, at the moment, nobody can come to the distillery. So I'm a bit of a mercenary. Yeah. I'll sell to anybody who wants whiskey yeah. regardless. Yeah, I mean, as a general rule of thumb, you know, when, when things are normal, um, are you quite happy to ship I'm out? Quite, quite happy, to, as I say. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, we made the decision that distillery exclusive shouldn't go on the website. Um, yeah. You know, for whatever reason, I, I can't even remember the conversation, but uh, I do remember it was held. Um, but uh, I, if somebody wants a bottle of Glen Murray and it's something that we have, um, if I can get that to you, I will happily send it out to yes. you. So it's, it's I get the impression. A few emails after this, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, I get the impression that maybe you should get a pen and pencil in because I think there might be a few orders coming in after once well, we stop recording. Well, I tell yeah, you what, yourself, it's, mate. It's, I, I'll be in tomorrow morning. Um, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm actually, I'm trying to be really um, kind of uh, stick to my old working schedule, but um, I've discovered Frasier on Channel 4 at nine o'clock in the morning, <laughs> I'm sitting having a coffee and, and legally, I'll use this as my get out clause, I'm not allowed to sell whiskey till after 10 a.m. anyway. So I'm finding I'm getting into the distillery about 10 o'clock um, and I'm there till about, you know, two o'clock in the afternoon and I'll be there tomorrow. So if anybody off the back of this, as I say, I'm not a salesperson. Yeah. Um, and I'm delighted if you do want to buy one of our whiskeys, but I'm not here to give you the hard sell. But no. if, if, if off this back of this conversation, there is a bottle of Glen Murray that you, you'd like to try. I will be in tomorrow between about 10 and two o'clock. Well, so what I'm, I'm just, to, just to cut everybody short a minute, uh, what I'm going to do now, because we're nearly running at two hours anyway. So, has anybody got any last questions they want asking before we stop recording and then we'll carry on after that or well uh, it, it it could have waited for after the recording but uh just so we have a, we have proof uh you were thinking about those 1978s at the whiskey circus bottling uh Soren, right <laughs> so that again sorry christoph where you breaking uh, up <laughs> uh sorry uh i was saying um you were in the know, Soren. The question is more for you than for Ian, but Soren, you were in the know and you were thinking about those 1978 oxeds for our Whiskey Circus uh, special bottling, right? Sorry again, Christoph, I didn't get a word of that. Okay, yeah. I'll write it down. Yeah, I, would, I, 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 would, I wouldn't fall for that one again. <laughs> you were sorry, right, our Whiskey well, Circus single cask. I think he wants the, the 1978 Glen Murray's. <laughs> Sorry, Paul, you're breaking up now as well. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. No, now, no. with that, that was something I was going to discuss in a minute anyway, but um, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to stop the recording now. So just want to say a massive thank you to Ian for coming on and, and answering quite a few questions. Um, we will carry on for a bit. Um, it'll suddenly get rowdy, you'll see, once I stop recording. Yeah, I, can, I um, can answer the questions that my marketing department don't want to hear now. So it's... Uh... Exactly. <laughs> Perfect. We are still recording, though. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, you know, thank you for coming on, Ian. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. Always enjoyed talking to you. Um, and that's it from me. I'm going to stop recording. Anybody want to say thank you before I do? Yeah, thank you, Ian. Yeah, 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 thank you so it. much once again. Uh, yeah. I'd, I'd like to say thanks to you guys because this is strange circumstances. Um, we don't um, get to do what we normally do. And uh, I'll be honest with you, this is keeping me as sane as anything, doing stuff like this. So um, thanks to you guys for... Uh, uh, I've me. just Cheers. opened the 24 pitted cask. Uh, you told me that was one of your favorites. And it's bloody fantastic. Which one is that? The 94, the 94 peated cask. cask. Yeah, it's delicious. So the 94 peated cask, that was an interesting one because we, we released a, a series of four casks at 94. Oh, there were four. What was, um, uh, I have the sherry and the peated. Uh, I've seen uh, someone on the marketplace of whiskey based selling the 94 bourbon. What's the yeah. fourth? Oh, no, sorry, there was meant to be four. Sorry, yeah, there was meant oh. to be four. So it was meant to be a 94 bourbon, a 94 Madeira, uh, 94 um, sherry, sherry, 94 peated cask, and 94 Madeira was meant to be the fourth in that collection. Um, I'm, I'm a terrible collector. 
Um, I, well, actually, I'm a good collector, but a terrible, uh, I collect everything um, uh, to the point where I have no room for stuff in my house. Uh, so I like things to come out as a collection in a series. So the idea was to bring out the 94 as a set collection um, of whiskies, which basically the 94 bourbon was the control dram showing mm -hmm. you Glen Murray within a bourbon cask. And then the other set were all finishes that went into cask at the same time or within a couple of weeks okay. of each other. So the finishes are exactly the same. The Madeira went to Germany. Um, we, we hadn't allocated it on the system. So it is available as a single cask that was released as an exclusive to the German market. And I was gutted because that, that kind of spoiled my collection theory. So um, the, the PX came out, has come out as a collection, two PXs, and this year is coming out as the three wine casks. So um, that, that's kind of the ethos behind it. So yeah, so the, the, the peated one is interesting because the peated one isn't my favourite from it. The 94 Sherry is my favourite. Yeah, it's the yeah. 94 Sherry is mind-boggling. But uh, honestly, but we, uh, I really do like this peated cask. Uh, where is the peated cask coming from? Um, or maybe it's a question for after the recording. We'll wait till after the recording. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ian, uh, do you do you prefer Glen Murray uh, in in bourbon or, or sherry? I absolutely. I, I'm a I'm a sherry. I'm a sucker for sherry casks all, <laughs> all the way. Um, speaking of guys who love sherry casks, there's Tom Thompson just signed in. <laughs> The love sherry cask, Ian? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I there he is. There he goes. <laughs> I, I do. I, I just, uh, you know, I, I was, I just kind of think I was weaned on sherry casks. Um, you know, even when I first, even before I went to Macallan, I was, I was drawn. I love a dark colored whiskey. You know, I know that we can add color to whiskey and I, I don't care because I'll buy it anyway. Um, and to the point where, you know, one of my favorites is actually a Glen Murray, which is not a Glen Murray release. This is amazing liquid. It is brilliant. Um, that one, exactly. That one. <laughs> I think I'm on my third of that. Um, <laughs> <The beast. laughs> so yeah, so I'm a sucker for sherry all round. So it's unfair for me to judge Glen Murray at any distillery, um, you know, because I, I will take their sherry releases every single time. Right, with that, um... I'm going to end the recording now this time. Um, just want to say hi to um, Tom. It's the first time we've had Tom in. Um, hi, Tom. I think we all know Hello. he's Mr. Big Pete himself. Yeah, sorry guys, <laughs> just been one of those busy weekends. Um, right, so we are now.